All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this awesome four-part series. And this is the third part that we're calling Getting Schooled by Ziggy with one of our industry's best-known engineers and, uh, and, and teachers and legend, uh, John Siegenthaler. John is a 35-year uh, veteran of, uh, of water-based engineering, and he has a passion for it. And what's really nice is he's sharing it with us today uh, with this webinar series. So I am your host, Dan Ashenden. I'm the group publisher of BNP Media's Mechanical Plumbing Group. We have three brands well-known that uh, John actually writes for a couple of them. Uh, the first one is Plumbing and Mechanical. That is the number one brand for contractors uh, focused. And then PM Engineer, which is the leading voice for Plumbing and Mechanical Engineers. And the final brand is Supply House Times, and that is the official publication and brand of the ASA for wholesale distributors. So we're proud to uh, partner with uh, with Kalefi and uh, and Ziggy to bring you this webinar series. And again, it's brought to you by webinar. Excuse me, the webinar is brought to you by Kalefi North America, with its outstanding hydronic solutions. And Kalefi has partnered with us, be it at BMP Media, to offer you this complimentary four-part mini series presented by Ziggy. So uh, again, today's uh, webinar and the theme is how to design, construct, and commission a hydronic heating and cooling system that leverages today's low energy uh, using technology while keeping things as simple as possible because we know that uh, comfort and high efficiency equal a happy customer. Um, so the getting, getting school plan here, uh, we've, we've done two of them, and today's third part is on heat emitters and air handlers. It's all in the details. Um, and then next Tuesday will be the final one, which is a, a final exam, uh, uh, but it, there's no real big test that you uh, need to worry about passing, but that'll be with controls and performance and the lessons learned throughout the whole series here. Um, you will receive a certificate of attendance uh, emailed to you for your continuing education credits if you so desire. Uh, so uh, we've got everything lined up for you here today, and without further delay, uh, I want to bring on Ziggy, but first we have a special guest uh, who's going to kick it off for us, and that's uh, Bob Hot Rod Roar. And Bob's going to talk about uh, just some specifics and uh, help with the Q and A with Ziggy. And uh, away we go. Bob, are you there? Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us today. We had a great crowd uh, on this third part, so I want to get right into it. Uh, a couple little housekeeping slides here. This is just some information. If you ever have trouble um, logging in, or if your audio's you know, funky or something like that, you can call the tech support number at uh, this are the people that run GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, and they're pretty responsive if you need technical help. So sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, you know, hanging up and dialing in again if you have a bad connection. You know, the voice might sound bad, but, um, and these will be archived on the Clef YouTube channel. Give us a couple of days to a week, and uh, I know the other ones, part one and two are up already, but the, they'll all be uh, sitting on our YouTube channel if you want to view them again sometime or share them. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to jump right into it here as far as um, <clears throat> what we've got going on. It's a great presenter, great presentation. I looked at it a little bit uh, last week, so I think you're going to enjoy this. Hydronics, oh, thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, let me do this one yet, yeah, Siggy. We're going to have Hydronics 27 should be out any uh, any week now. I think it's at the printer as we speak, and it's going to be on, uh, on the topic that we're talking about, heat pumps, air to water heat pumps and stuff. So um, keep your eye out for that. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, just another resource um, I want to mention uh, the, a series of ebooks that's available from BNP Media. These are all free. And if you go to that link down at the bottom there, or actually a, a faster way, just go to the PM Magazine website, pmmag.com, scroll down to multimedia, and click on that, and you'll get right to a series of five ebooks. And these cover about 340 articles and columns that have been written in Plumbing Mechanical, PM Engineer, and uh, Supply House Times, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, going back to uh, 1996. So there's a lot of resource material for you. Um, as Bob was mentioning, uh, we do have the past two sessions here. Uh, June 2nd was the intro session, just an overview of the project. And also last week, we got into the heating and cooling sources. If you go to the Kalefi YouTube channel, you'll see uh, uh, right over here uh, a playlist that has the, um, the first two and we will have this session and the last session. So these are all being archived. So today, uh, as Dan was mentioning, we're going to be talking about the heat emitters and the air handlers used in this system. 
Uh, just a quick recap, this is a 3,300 square foot low energy house in upstate New York. And uh, it does have two heat pumps in it. It has a geothermal water to water heat pump. And also it's serving as a test site for an air to water heat pump. And both of those heat pumps uh, supply the heating and cooling uh, to a series of heat emitters. So last week we talked about the sources. Today we're gonna talk about the heat emitters. So um, as I've been mentioning, as we've gone through these, uh, low water temperature is critical to good performance on any heat pump system. So we're, we're gonna look at a variety of different heat emitters that were used in this project. And these were used to basically adapt uh, a low water temperature to the, uh, I'll say the client requirements, where, uh, where could we use floor heating, where we could not use floor heating based on floor coverings and so forth. And one of the things I, I, I want to stress, it, it shows you the versatility of hydronics, that there are some very specific client requirements and how you can manipulate these different heat emitters and, and ultimately bring them together into a common distribution system that is going to operate at low water temperatures to get good performance on that heat pump. So in this project, there are two different types of radiant floor panels that were used. And we'll, we'll also see how panel radiators, <clears throat> excuse me, how panel radiators were integrated into the design. And also one of the unique uh, attributes of a heat pump is that it can produce chill water. So we incorporated that uh, using a single air handler for cooling. So let's start with the basement and work our way up. Uh, the basement has a four inch concrete slab and you'll see the basic tubing layout drawing over here on the upper right. Um, I'm a firm believer in making tubing layout drawings before we put down tubing in, in any kind of a project. It simply lets you do the thinking on, in this case, a CAD system before you get out there and start saying, well, you know, I've got a thousand foot coil of pipe. How should I break this up into circuits? Uh, where are there gonna be holes in the floor and so forth? Get all that out of the way, do the drawing up front, and then the, the actual physical installation goes much faster and, and much less prone to error. So in the basement, there are five circuits. And you'll see in this upper right here, you might wonder why did, why did we do the circuits this way? Well, my son-in-law, who's, uh, I'll say the client in this case, he's talking about the possibility of partitioning off this walkout basement in the future. So we laid out these circuits so that if these partitions are constructed in the future, they could go down and we could still do room by room balancing of the circuit, or even if we wanted to put separate thermostats in, we could do room by room zoning. So again, we accommodated that future possibility by uh, using <clears throat> this type of a layout. Now you'll see the, also there's different colors used on each circuit. It just makes it easier to see where each circuit goes. Uh, you also see these black uh, short line segments here. These represent control joints. This is where there's going to be saw cuts in the floor. So we use a short length of a polyethylene sleeving wherever that control joint's gonna be. And that's uh, simply that when the, the slab eventually will crack at the control joint, that takes the stress off the tubing. It doesn't let the tubing become, if you will, the, the, the hinge between those two slabs. It's a very minor amount of movement, very minor. Uh, I mean, literally it could be a millimeter, but We've, uh, we've used these slabs, uh, or these sleeves rather, for years uh, under sawn control joints. And again, it's good to identify where those joints are going to be. All these circuits come back to a manifold station that is actually in the mechanical room. Uh, you can see here, there's five circuits all together. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, near the overhead, or near the uh, doors and the windows, which basically is along the south side here, we did put a small amount of tubing at six inches on center. That's the coldest portion of the slab floor. So we, we typically like to tighten that tube spacing up a little bit right there. Just so if somebody's standing at a window or standing inside that patio door, especially barefoot when it's zero degrees outside, 
the floor is uh, is nice and warm there. Uh, you also see that we avoided certain things like, for example, this is a bathroom in the basement. Here's the toilet flange. We don't want tubing directly next to that flange because it could soften the wax ring. Uh, there's no need for tubing under the cabinet here. Um, actually, there is some tubing under the stairs, but that's really just a leader to get out to these other circuits. Uh, if we didn't have to run the tubing to these other circuits, there's really no need to put the tubing under the slab. Uh, we tend not to put tubing in the mechanical room because we get heat loss uh, from the piping and the other components there. Now there is a little bit of tubing, and again, this is part of the leaders out to the other circuits. So um, most of the areas here are 12 inches on center. And let's see, I'm gonna move over to the breezeway. Now this particular house has a an eight foot by 12 foot breezeway that is conditioned space. And you'll see that has a separate circuit and we tighten the tube spacing up here to six inches because the breezeway has a lot of exposed wall area. Uh, there's also two doors, actually there's three doors that go to unconditioned space. So the heat flux that's required in that area is higher, significantly higher than what's required in the basement. So we tighten the tube spacing up, you'll see some photos in some later slides here, six inches on center for that. And uh, we made a provision to get that circuit through the wall into the basement. And ultimately that goes back to the same manifold that serves um, <clears throat> the upstairs circuits. And then finally, uh, this is a three stall garage and we set up tubing circuits in there. Those circuits go to, a, that's a separate zone. Uh, those circuits go back to a manifold which connects to a brace plate heat exchanger. And we run that zone on a 30% solution of inhibited propylene glycol. We like to do that in, in our cold upstate New York locations, simply because that allows the owner to, to shut it off completely if they don't want heat out there. If they're trying to conserve energy, they can completely shut off that zone, not worry about anything freezing. And even if somebody said, I wanna keep that zone going, in a prolonged power outage, with just water in that circuit and potentially very cold temperatures outside, uh, where that freezing is gonna occur is right here, right next to these overhead doors. So again, we, we'd like to prevent the possibility of, of problems by separating that garage circuit out with glycol. So that's the overall layout. This is all slab on grade type radiant. Now, just some photos. Uh, one of the first things that's done uh, in the basement is to locate that manifold station. Now, again, it was shown on the plan and we made accurate measurements. And if you take a look at that photo, you see a couple pieces of half inch rebar that were driven right down through the foam insulation. And those, uh, those rebars support a piece of plywood, which is, is temporary. Uh, there's just some conduit straps that hold that there. And in this case, the manifold was close to a wall. So we also put a, tap, a couple tap cons in the wall. So we've got good stability on that manifold station and that becomes our anchor. That's where we're going to run our tubing circuits. And you can also see paint right here on the foam. Uh, Harvey Euchre, who did the work on this, firm believer in taking some spray paint, laying out, not necessarily spray painting the entire circuit, but spray painting basically where those leaders are going to go away from that manifold station and maybe where some of the turns are out there. And again, that just saves time in the field. Uh, you, you might say, well, it takes time to put that paint down, but with, with a plan, you can actually put that paint down pretty quick. And then once you start pulling tubing off the uncoiler, it can go down quite, quite quickly. So here's Harvey. Harvey was really getting fried this was uh, about a year ago in June. And so we've got this little cocoon here that's completely insulated with the June sun shining in it. So it got pretty warm in there, but here he is. Uh, he's making a connection. This is um, half inch PEX aluminum PEX tubing. You can see he's got some flexible polyethylene sleeving over the tubing where it makes its radius from the floor up to the underside of the manifold station. The entire basement, with the exception of load-bearing footing locations, 
has two inches of extruded polystyrene on underside insulation. And uh, here he is uh, tying it down. This is with uh, wire ties. Uh, roughly about every two and a half feet on straight runs. And then we typically put down three of those wire ties on each of the return bends. Uh, the PEX aluminum PEX tubing, one nice thing about it, it's, it, it bends and it retains the shape that you bend it to. So uh, that goes down nice. Here's the uh, overall layout. And you can see what Harvey's done is he actually took the plan and he spray painted where these future partitions may be going. <clears throat> these, are, these are actually some partitions that are definitely going to be built. You see the riser piping here for that bathroom. Here's the manifold station. And you can see he used different colors of spray paint just to, again, make sure that each circuit is, um, is laid out on the foam uh, prior to actually pulling the tubing off the coil. Uh, the tubing's all in place at this point, and it's awaiting the pressure test. We'll pump this up to about 75 PSI. Uh, what our experience over the years has been is if you see the pressure go down, it's one of two things. It's either the sun is going down and air is getting cooler and air is going to, uh, the pressure is going to go down simply because the air is cooling, or you've got a connection uh, on the manifold that you might not have tightened up. And uh, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to have a leak in the tubing, but uh, I think over the course of 35 years, I've seen one case where I would say it probably was a defect in the tube. Uh, but still, we're going to run a pressure test. We, we don't want to have any leaks in this. Uh, there are no joints out there in the slab. All the joints, everything is back at the manifold station. Uh, another advantage of making that tubing layout plan is that you know the circuit lengths. And if you have a list of circuit lengths, you can organize which circuits are coming out of which coil. So you're, you're, you're minimizing your waste on coils, especially if you have new coils and perhaps some remnant coils from past projects, um, having that list of circuits and, and using the CAD system to measure those out uh, gives you uh, uh, the ability to determine which coils are we going to cut these from. So there's the concrete. We were able to back the truck right up within about four feet of the foundation. We made sure everything was good and compacted. The backfill so that truck isn't going to sink in and tip over into the foundation. And you can see what he's done here. He's taken a, uh, a piece of, uh, looks like a sewer pipe and just made an extension chute. So they were able to get, uh, move that truck around and use that extended chute to put all that concrete down. So there was 19 yards of concrete going into that slab. Now the, the schematic of what's going on in the basement is very simple. There's a single circulator and there's a, a motorized mixing valve and that mixing valve operates based on outdoor reset control. Uh, you can see the graph over here, even at minus 10 outside, which was the design low temperature, we only need 90 degree water. We probably could have spread that tubing out a little bit farther because the heat flux requirement is pretty low. But again, tubing is relatively inexpensive. Anything we can do to keep water temperatures down with the heat pump is, is beneficial. So that basement does operate as a separate zone. <clears throat> um, here's the, the supply from the buffer tank. And then uh, on the return side, we've got a purge valve and we've got a check valve to make sure that we don't get any flow through the spool of the mixing valve and then back up through here when another zone is operating. So pretty simple layout there. You want to do a couple questions, Siggy? Got a minute? Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. It's regular PEX or is it a PEX LPEX? It's PEX LPEX. Oh, it is. Okay. I, I think I typed somebody the wrong answer. Then. So it is PEX LPEX. And then um, the uh, insulation, R10, is there a code requirement on the underslab insulation in your area or an energy code that you know of? No, um, not to my knowledge, although if it's a heated basement, I honestly, I, I should check New York State Energy Code. They, they may have a requirement, uh, but I'm sure it's not R10. It's probably R5 if there is a requirement. Um, I've always looked at this, and as, especially as we you know look forward uh, with rising energy prices, you, you only get one shot to do this under underside insulation properly. 
And there was a time, uh, again, probably 25 plus years ago when we used one inch under a basement slab. But uh, for the difference in price and considering it's there for the life of the building, our standard now has been two inches under any slab. Uh, and I, I'm sure we would find people that would make the argument that even that's not enough. You know, if you're going for a passive type building, uh, ultra low energy consumption, you might find uh, somebody looking for three or four inches of foam under the slab. There is a diminishing return there, um, but we did use two inches of extruded polystyrene under any of the slabs. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, parts of Canada tried to push the code for four inches, and then the people were finding out the insulation costs more than the entire job, so they had to scale that back because it, a lot of contractors were losing jobs because of the cost of the insulation to put four inches of foam on their jobs. So yeah, I yeah. I, I've seen projects with that. In fact, uh, believe it or not, one of the, the passive house uh, projects involve 14 inches of foam under that. And that's where I, I get really concerned about structural ability. I mean, foam does have compressive strength and there is some small amount of compression, but when you have 14 inches of it, that could, uh, I think, potentially cause some structural issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's quite a few more questions, but I think I'll type okay. in some answers. Climate Zone 5, I think you're in up there, Siggy? Yes. Yeah, I put that yep. in there. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the... Uh, I'll let you roll here a little bit. Okay. Well, you can see what, what these masons choose to do is uh, they put a two by four down the center, leveled it, and um, they're, they're pouring this slab basically in two halves. And this guy, I, I want to call him out. I call him the WWF lifter. And that, that's not World Wrestling Federation. That's uh -huh. welded wire fabric lifter. And I've been a, a strong advocate that you don't want to leave tubing at the bottom of a concrete slab. It does have an effect on performance. And again, overall objective, keep this water temperature low so our heat pump has a good coefficient of performance. So we, we put right in the specs and we have a good understanding with the concrete contractors. We're going to have one person and their sole responsibility is to go around and you can see what he's doing there. He's got a hook and he's hooking the welded wire fabric and just jostling it a bit, getting some concrete underneath it um, to make sure that that is lifted. And I, I've got another slide that will get into a little bit more detail, but just show you some other photos here. This is where they've got it uh, screeded on the first half, then they pull up the board. They're pouring the second half, and again, we were fortunate we could back the truck right up. And here's the whole job with the uh, center screed removed. It's been screeded, but it hasn't been trowelled yet. You can see uh, this blue tank up here with piping and wiring coming down. We set up the well pump temporarily so we'd have water so we could, we could spray down this slab. As soon as that power trowel is off that slab, especially with the June sun beating down on it, we'd like to keep that slab wet and allow that concrete to properly cure uh, with extreme sun and drying conditions, uh, the surface of the concrete can actually dry or the water can evaporate before that uh, curing, that chemical reaction of the, the Portland cement has properly uh, occurred. And you can, you can get a dusty or you can get a surface that has a lot of little micro fractures in it. So get, keep the water on there. And uh, here's the, uh, the mason doing the power trawling, uh, great guy did a nice job of especially around the uh, risers there for the plumbing they got back in there and uh, hand mag that all down uh, the entire basement you can see in these photos uh, the wall insulation actually goes right down to the footing that's two inches of extruded polystyrene and then the floor insulation butts up to that so this entire slab is sitting in and surrounded by uh, foam insulation now, uh, back to the, uh, the lifting of the uh, welded wire, okay? Again, what we want is to operate the system with the lowest possible water temperature for good performance. So here's a photo down in the lower left that shows the tubing. This is actually from a different project, but it shows a concept. The tubing and the welded wire have been lifted to the point where there's some concrete underneath. And I'm sure we're not going to get this exactly at the midpoint of the slab all the way through, but I want to show you that we actually did some modeling of 
the performance of a four inch bare slab. And we used a finite element analysis technique, a computer simulation. And all we did is we moved the tubing. Here's a graphic. We moved the tubing from roughly one inch below the surface of the slab to the midpoint of the slab and then all the way down to the bottom of the slab. We didn't change anything else. Same insulation, same water temperature, same flow rate. We simply wanted to see what is the effect of heat output if the tubing is deeper in the concrete. And uh, this is the result of that simulation. And what we're looking at here is the depth of the center of the tube below the surface of the slab versus the upward heat output. This is based on half inch PEX tubing, 12 inch on center spacing in a four inch thick bare concrete slab. And it's, it's, this particular graph is based on 100 degrees the average water temperature in the circuit. And you can see there's definitely a drop off. Uh, there's actually the, uh, the optimal of these three conditions that we looked at would be with the tubing up near the surface of the slab. That presents logistic problems, uh, trying to get the tube and maintain it at that depth. And obviously, if you're going to do saw cuts in the slab, that's going to cut through that tubing. So uh, from a practical standpoint, we shoot for approximately the center of the slab. But even if we compare the center to the bottom of the slab, you can see there's a pretty significant drop off here in performance. So what does it mean in terms of water temperature? Well, <clears throat> we model that for two rates of heat output, uh, heat flux, uh, 15 BTUs per square foot per hour and 30. Uh, 30 would be characteristic of perhaps a garage or an older structure. 15 would be more characteristic of a modern house. Uh, in this basement with all the insulation that's in this, uh, the heat flux is probably less than 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. But even at 15, here's the average water temperature required for 15 BTUs per hour per square foot with the tubing at the midpoint of the slab. Here's what it increases to with the tubing at the bottom of the slab. So there's a seven degree increase in water temperature to get the same rate of heat output. And that becomes uh, about a 14 degree difference at the higher heat flux. So as the heat flux rate goes down, the, the delta between the water temperature with the tube at the bottom of the slab and the center of the slab does decrease. But again, why, why sacrifice performance on the heat pump when it's not really that difficult to lift this mesh? Uh, so we make sure that any specifications or drawings that we write, uh, make sure that it's clear that that tubing should be lifted. We are gonna leave it at the bottom of the slab at a control joint. And actually here you can see the sleeves where there's going to be a control joint saw cut we are gonna leave the tubing at the bottom there and sweep it up on both sides of that. Uh, I'll take the slight drop in performance over a, a slice through there with a control joint saw any day. So um, again, that's what uh, what's going on here with lifting the tubing. Now, uh, we also wanted to make sure we had a provision to get utilities between the basement, which you see in the background here and the breezeway. So we installed three conduits. And you might be saying, well, how, how come you put the 45 degree offsets in there? Well, that's so that where these conduits enter the basement was not in a living space. All right. And interesting thing happened. Uh, went over to the project one morning and I found these uh, sleeves through the wall were lined up directly across here. So they were going to take a straight shot through. Uh, for one thing, it's kind of difficult to get that in there when you uh, think about it, trying to get that fitting in there, that coupling, uh, this two inch schedule 40 tubing doesn't bend that easily. So that's one logistical problem. But the other logistical problem would be that all our utilities coming from the breezeway back into the basement would all enter into finished space. They'd enter high on the wall, but we'd have to box it in. And again, I, I look at that. If you can pre-plan it so you don't have to do these uh, you know, these Band-Aid patch-ups later on, uh, do it. Uh, this this is all set in sand, all tamped down, watered down. Um, here's how we brought that one circuit into the breezeway. Uh, actually, the basement wall is back here. 
So there's a 45 degree elbow and then a, uh, a piece of uh, just some Schedule 40 PVC. We just cut it off at a 45 degree angle so we could transition uh, the PEX aluminum PEX out into the slab. You can see we cut a taper on the top of the foam here. So when the slab is poured, the top of the slab actually goes just about back to where the two by six bottom plate of the wall is. Uh, here's a shot. This shows where the, uh, you can see these arrows point to where the um, three conduits come up into the garage. Here's a three circuit Kalefi manifold. It's actually right now under an air pressure test. Here's a Schrader valve to put the air pressure in and the gauge to read it. And there's what it looks like with the two being six inches on center in the breezeway, uh, ready to go. Uh, that plank across there is just foot traffic. We try to keep the foot traffic off the tubing um, until that slab is poured. Uh, you, again, you can see the tapered insulation here. That insulation does get dinged up a bit between uh, stripping the forms and just normal traffic. So, uh, you know, it's dinged up a little bit. If we had any areas that were really uh, torn up, we, uh, we made sure we patched them up. Okay. So again, just the, we're out in the garage now. Here's that same manifold. Here's the three conduits. Uh, the original plan was to go to three 12 inch by 12 inch drainage basins uh, centered on each stall. Uh, the, the masonry contractor suggested we go to a linear drain and uh, it does make their life a little easier as far as getting the proper taper on the slab. So, yep, we did that. We went back to a 24 foot long uh, linear drain. It slopes to the center point and um, we made sure our tubing layout drawing accommodated that. Obviously, we don't want to try to get tubing through that drain. So uh, we accommodate that. You can see the control joint sleeves here, uh, that green spray paint was put down by, uh, actually Harvey did the tubing layout here. Uh, he spray painted right where those control joints are going to be so that he knew where to put the sleeves in. And the garage uh, schematic, again, it's pretty simple. There's three circuits, circulator. This is a, uh, let's see, this is a five by 12 by 30 plate stainless steel heat exchanger. And there's another circulator when this zone is operating that brings heated water from the buffer tank over to the primary side of the uh, heat exchanger. And then the glycol, basically everything you see here with the pink background has uh, a 30% solution of propylene glycol in it. And again, that's all operated as a separate zone. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, back into the main house. This is the main floor level. And uh, Heidi and Andy, the, the clients here, they had different floor coverings picked out. They wanted to go with uh, tile in the bathrooms. They decided on an engineered wood floor for the living room and the dining room area, kitchen area. And then the three bedrooms were all going to have a carpet and pad. So we had some areas that we could accommodate with floor heating, especially the tile areas. And we took a really close look at that engineered wood fl uh, floor to make sure that we had enough, um, that I should say, we took a look at it, making sure we didn't have too much R value. We're going to use an underside tube and plate system here with eight inch on center tube spacing. And this shows, uh, pretty good representation of, of what we have. Now, our floor framing was 24 inches on center with eye joists. This shows it 16 on center, but the concept is still the same. The aluminum plates and the PEX aluminum PEX tubing are stapled up to the bottom of the subfloor. And where we had tile, uh, we have a three quarter inch uh, oriented strand board subfloor that got a uh, Schluter, what's called a Ditra XL anti-fracture membrane over it. And we made sure that that anti-fracture membrane had a rating for 24 inch on center framing. Uh, Schluter and, and other companies make different types of membranes. These membranes, if you're not familiar with them, these are designed to prevent cracks, that shrinkage cracks that might occur um, due to, uh, for example, shrinkage of the subflooring over time. It's designed to prevent those cracks from going up and cracking the tile and the grout lines up above it. So uh, the areas that did have ceramic tile all had the uh, anti-fracture membrane. 
Uh, we made a tubing layout drawing. You can see these circuits are laid out. And if you look carefully here, you'll see these little fine black lines. What I like to do with an underfloor tube and plate system, I like to show where all the floor framing is. So we can lay the tubing out and, and know where our return bends are going to be, what our lengths are going to be, and so forth. Uh, another detail that you see here, there's a note, it says no plates under island. There's actually a kitchen island here. And just like kitchen cabinets, refrigerators, so forth, there's no there's no need to put tubing under this kind of a, uh, a floor area where you're going to have a substantial blockage of heat flow up above, especially if food is ever stored in those uh, lower cabinets or in that island. So uh, you'll see how we handle that. We we basically ran the tubing under there, but we didn't put any plates on. And without the plates, there's very, very little heat output from that tubing. Um, over here, this is where the, uh, the master bathroom circuit is. <clears throat> and this tubing layout is kind of difficult. You'll see they're very short runs, a lot of turns. It was tedious, but it was necessary. Um, so Harvey did a great job. He put the tubing in patiently, made those bends and put the plates up. Again, we, uh, we left the tubing out underneath these cabinets other than the return bends. Um, underneath the shower, there was just too much going on under that shower from a plumbing standpoint to put the tubing there. Uh, here you see a leader that goes up to the other bathroom. Um, <clears throat> again, we had a, a base cabinet, the toilet, and the shower. With it, we looked at what's practical. You know, could we have put, for example, another tubing run under the shower? Possibly. Would it have made much of a difference? Seriously, probably an uh, imperceptible difference. Okay. So those areas that you see with the green box around them, those were the underside tubing plate areas. But we also had some areas that we, we couldn't handle with tubing plate because of the floor coverings. Um, I should make note down here, <clears throat> we do have a towel warmer. And we, we decided to put the towel warmer right in series with that floor heating circuit. That circuit is quite short. It's 127 feet. So the head loss is pretty low. Head loss of a towel warmer like that, I'll, I'll show you a photo of the towel warmer. It's very little. There's, a, there's several half inch nominal tubes that the flow breaks up through so that the head loss is very little. So basically we said, let's tie the towel warmer and the floor heating into a common circuit and we'll control that as a zone. And I'll, I'll show you how we did that zoning. And you also see up here, these are the five panel radiators that we used. Uh, the three that are in the bedroom were chosen because again, the bedrooms have carpet and padding. Those three are going to have thermostatic operators on them. So each of these bedrooms can operate as a separate zone. The two that are out in the living room, they're actually going to be tied in with the floor circuit because this whole area, the living room, dining room, and the, the kitchen area all are one big open area. So those operate as a single zone and they actually operate off a, of an electrical thermostat. Okay. Now, I want to show you how we did the zoning too. Again, those two panel rads and the underfloor tube and plate in the dining room and the kitchen they operate as a single zone controlled by a zone valve controlled by a thermostat. Uh, we have a zone in that bedroom, a zone here, a zone, uh, a separate zone of floor heating in the, um, I'll just say the second bathroom. We have a panel radiator with a TRV on it that operates as a zone in the master uh, bedroom. And then finally, we have this combination of a towel warmer and a uh, floor heating that operate as zone number six. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can see we there's a lot of zones here, and we used a combination of thermostats and TRVs, and actually two different types of TRVs. Some of the panel reds, the, the the panel reds that are in the bedrooms have an integral TRV, but the floor heating circuits, we decided to use a thermostatic valve, and we used one where the operator for the valve, where you set it, is actually up on the wall. There's a capillary tube that leads down to the valve body, and the actuator, which are under the floor, but accessible. 
very important. We don't want to bury a valve that potentially could use some service down the road. We don't want to bury that and forget where it is. We want we made sure we had an excess panel for that. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that we did not install plates under the kitchen island. And here you can see, here are the plates. These are five inch wide plates. Uh, the tubing is eight inches on center. Uh, plenty of staples to hold those plates up tight against the subfloor. Nice straight runs with the PEX aluminum PEX. Uh, we also uh, set up the plumbing so that wherever possible, the plumbing is below the insulation. Uh, there's going to be six inch fiberglass bats that'll be pressed up against the underside of that uh, tube and plate system to make sure we steer the heat to the upward side of the floor. But by keeping the plumbing, especially any traps, drainage piping, down below, we're, we're not going to, for example, evaporate water from a trap that might not be used for a few weeks, okay? We're not going to cause the cold water pipe to deliver warm water to, let's say, a kitchen sink if the uh, floor heating system happens to be operating. So these are small little details, but ultimately they're important uh, in, in planning the system out. So how do you put all these floor circuits and these panel radiators and these different types of TRVs together? Well, here's the distribution system. It, it all starts from the header on the buffer tank. We have a variable speed Delta P circulator. This is a Taco 0018, which uh, actually is a very cool little circulator. You can set it up with, uh, it has a Bluetooth connection. You can go right to your phone and you can see exactly what that pump is doing in terms of flow rate, head, wattage at any point. So this comes up and it splits. Uh, we have two manifold stations here. Uh, this manifold station was set up for the, I'll call it the great room area, the, the dining room, the kitchen, the living room. Here are the two panel radiators, <clears throat> the two panel radiators that are in the living room. And then there's the three floor circuits that are in the kitchen and the dining room. And you can see they just simply come back as individual circuits, half inch PEX aluminum PEX, and there's a thermostat that operates a zone valve. Uh, this circulator operates continuously whenever the system is put into its heating mode. There's a switch, simply uh, turn that switch to heat, typically in the fall, and it's gonna stay in that heating position right through the winter. So this circulator always has power to it when the system is heating mode. But the circulator has the intelligence to know if that zone valve is closed, uh, it's going to sit there in basically what I call sleeper mode. It's going to sit there at about five watts and uh, simply wait until it sees a slight drop in differential pressure, which would indicate that, you know, there's, uh, well, that the zone valve in that case would be open and then it'll speed up. Um, over on the right, there's another manifold station. And we purposely left some spare connections on that. If down the road, somebody wants to add a panel radiator, or perhaps add a towel warmer, the connections are already available on the manifold. We don't have to get into changing a manifold or trying to extend the manifold. We simply put caps to, to uh, seal off those circuits, uh, you know, until they might be needed. So here we have home run circuits. Again, it's all half inch PEX aluminum PEX. It goes up to the three panel radiators that are in the three bedrooms. Each of these has a thermostatic radiator valve on it. Here's a circuit that combines the towel warmer, and you can see that here's the towel warmer, okay? Combines it with the floor heating circuit in the master bathroom. And there's the knob that controls it. So you're basically looking at a very simple knob. It has numbers from one to five. If it doesn't have exact temperatures, and typically set it at three, that's a normal comfort range, but if you want it warmer, you can turn it up. If you want it cooler, you can turn it down. And there's a capillary tube that goes down through the partition. Uh, it's a two meter long capillary tube that goes down to the valve body down below in the basement. Um, here's a uh, close up of the piping where it comes up through the, the floor. And you can see there's an isolation valve here. These are called H valves. There's a uh, ball valve on each side, and then there is simply an adapter to take the half inch PEX aluminum PEX to this valve. Uh, the H valve screws right up into the bottom of the panel radiator, and this would allow you to shut off flow to that panel if for some reason you have to take the panel off the wall. You, 
you know, possibly might have to take it off the wall if you want to paint behind it in the future. Uh, certainly, you know, down the road, if there was a problem with the radiator, if there was a leak, you could isolate it. So we used these uh, H valves to uh, provide isolation on each of the panel rads. And uh, rather than look at that orange pipe, uh, we use these uh, little plastic covers and just cut them with an exacto saw and snap them over the tube. And there's a little plastic escutcheon plate that uh, also neatens up the, uh, the holes going through the floor. Um, and over here, these are the three panel radiators that are in each of the uh, bedrooms. And you can see there's the thermostatic radiator valve in the upper right corner. And then you can see below each radiator. Uh, these are Mycin uh, T6 panel rads. Uh, one nice thing I really like about those is that the connections are at the center point of the radiator. So if you're roughing this piping in, you don't have to know exactly, well, I shouldn't say it that way. When you have a radiator that has offset connections, and typically some other radiators, panel rads, have connections that are kind of uh, biased over to the right-hand side. Well, you have to know where to drill those holes through the floor. So you, you, know, you have to have the spec sheet and know exactly where those are relative to, let's say, the center line of the window. Uh, with these products, Basically, you file the center line of the window right down, and you go one inch on either side of the center line, and you drill your holes, and uh, your tubing's gonna line right up with the uh, connections on the bottom of those radiators. So, a um, couple last points here. This one small circulator, when everything here is wide open, when all these TRVs are wide open, uh, the zone valve is on, that circulator draws 43 watts and it, it operates somewhere around four gallons per minute. Very adequate for the uh, load that it has. Um, so it's, it's a low power distribution system. And also we put a couple, um, these are quick setter valves. These are uh, flow setters, so we could balance. At least we can also read the flow rate, what percentage of the flow is going to each portion of this system. So. Again, when you look at the overall schematic, it looks complex. You know, look at floor heating, there's towel warmers, there's different types of valves involved here. But fundamentally, these circuits are all in parallel and we, we simply adapted how we did the zoning based on what we had for heat emitters, whether it's floor heating or whether it's panel rads, okay? Just some photos here. Um, here's the, the manifold that services the living room, dining room, and kitchen. Here's the, the zone valve. Uh, these are Kalefi manifolds. We made sure we ordered the inverted manifold so that the air vent is pointing up. Obviously, if you if you have, you're getting a manifold station, and these are, um, I believe these are put on here with Loctite. So you wanna order the manifold so that knowing which way the tubing is going, the, the air vent's in the proper orientation. Uh, you can see the quick setter over here. And then the other manifold, uh, you can see here, this is the manifold that goes up to this portion of the system over here. Um, we do have our drainage pipe for one of the toilets, uh, just we had to run it like that. Uh, and you can see the quick setter valves that are over here. Right. Just another photo, there's the two manifold stations. Uh, this is one inch copper that goes back to the header on the buffer tank. Uh, again, variable speed pump. I've seen this pump operate down. I think the lowest I've seen it so far was about 21 or 22 watts under part load conditions. Uh, again, you just pull your phone out and uh, go to the app and it pops right up there with the um, identity of the pump. If you have multiple pumps in there, you can identify, give each pump a name and you can, in a sense, interrogate what's, what's the pump doing. Some more photos, uh, running half inch PEX aluminum PEX through the floor joists. Uh, we like to drill through the center of the joist, through the, in this case, the webbing. Uh, that's the minimum structural impact. And uh, if you've not worked with these eye joists before, there's actually a chart that the manufacturer gives you that shows you where and how large the holes can be. I believe at the center of a clear span, you can actually remove the entire web if you want to has to do with how the stresses are distributed. Uh, that's probably a three inch hole and there's several uh, runs of PEX aluminum PEX going through it. 
Uh, one detail I do want to really stress to you, when we, we put this tubing in and we look at these return bends, um, this is the band joist area. So this is basically one inch of oriented strand board and on the outside of that is the Tyvek and then the vinyl siding. Well, this is going to get sprayed with foam insulation, about three and a half or four inches. You don't want to have this tubing right up next to this band joist. All right, it's going to be sprayed with foam. Now that in itself isn't a problem to spray foam on the tubing. The problem is going to be if most of the foam is on the warm side of the tubing, and for whatever reason there's no flow going through this tubing. Remember, this is this is water, and on the other side of that band joist, it could be easily minus 10 degrees. If that flow is off for a few hours, that could be a potential freeze up. So what we did is we actually just by hand we bent these return bends down so that we could get at least four inches of space between this tubing and the inside surface of this band joist to make sure that that foam insulation is between the water and where that cold temperature could occur. It's a small detail but it's an easy one to overlook. Um, this shows where the capillary tube comes down through a partition and you'll see a piece of string here. This is basically used just to guide the capillary tube down through there. Here's the, um, this is a half inch thermostatic valve, but it's not gonna have the, uh, a dial type operator on it. It's, it's gonna have the end of the capillary tube. There's a small actuating device that screws right onto that valve. This one was accessible from the underside of the basement. Uh, there was one other one that we, we put a small plastic panel in the ceiling, about 12 inches square, directly under the valve. If we ever have to get to the valve, we just pop that plastic cover off and the valve's right there. Um, again, here's another shot that shows the wall-mounted knob that is used to adjust that. And another shot of the uh, dual isolation valve here. Okay. And here's a typical, um, again, eight inches on center, five inch wide plates, uh, six inch fiberglass insulation up against the uh, underside of the plates and the domestic piping down below that. Now on the first episode I showed you this little area, I call it the kitty jail. This is, um, this is basically the result of wanting to have a window and a dormer on the north side. So when you frame an area like that, typically they're, uh, these are all attic trusses up on the second floor level. Uh, we have a double truss on each side that runs all the way across. So on the uh, north side, there's a railing, there's a window, and there's this little uh, door here that you actually can crawl through if you're careful. So there's a little play area. Well, that means there's going to be another area similar to this on the other side of the uh, attic truss. And this is what it looks like. You can see here's the dual trusses on each side. It's just a sloping upper cord. So that's where we put the chill water air handler. Uh, this is a, a nominal three ton air handler. It's got an ECM blower. You can select different blower speeds on it. And uh, it's actually configurable. You can change the coil orientation in this portion of the air handler. It's, it's got an A coil in it, an A-shaped coil. You can change that for either horizontal or vertical mounting of that. So obviously here we're horizontal. We set it up on a uh, secondary drainage pan because it it is over well it is over occupied space. There's a drywall ceiling ultimately underneath that. If the primary drain pan in the air handler ever failed, the secondary pan would catch the condensate. There's actually a float switch there too. So if we get a, a plug in the trap, that float switch will disable the blower. So we've got this space now. The space above the OSB is all insulated. That's got four inches of foam and five and a half inches of mineral wool. So that's an R51 ceiling, half inch o OSB. Same thing down here, okay? Here's a shot of that space um, where the, the opening uh, is actually, we can, you can see the drywall's been installed here. Disconnect switch. We use three quarter inch pre-insulated PEX tubing. So we could run pre-insulated PEX right from the air handler back through the framing right down to the mechanical room. So we didn't have to try to get in there and 
slide pieces of insulation on the PEX tubing. And for a three ton air handler, uh, in the distance we were going, uh, the three quarter inch PEX was fine as far as a head loss. Uh, you can just see a little bit of the return air grill here. Uh, return air all comes up through an open stairwell and comes into the rear of the air handler. And then the ducting, uh, we had to do a little offset here uh, because we had a truss core right in the way. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how do you cover a big hole like that? I'll show you. Uh, here's the ducting. Uh, this is metal ducting with uh, just a bubble foil insulation over it. I want to point out all the ducting and the air handler are all within the condition space. You can see the spray foam up here. And again, all this was eventually insulated um, with uh, mineral wool. And then there are um, furring strips about every 12 inches that hold everything back in, in position. And this is what it looks like finished. Now, this is actually our, our contractor suggested this and it worked out really well. Uh, we basically, or he did, the contractor built a bookshelf and this is on rollers. And there's a frame that goes around this, but it does not attach to the baseboard. So to take this out, there's basically four screws, pop the screws and you just literally grab it and it rolls right out of there. So that's how you get access to that air handler. Um, it could have been a, a set of doors, but we had the space. So we, instead of just putting a set of doors there, we made it into a little a bookshelf area. Okay. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end here. So as we've done in, in the past episodes, uh, time for a giveaway, All right? So the first person that correctly answers the following question gets a t-shirt. Okay, everybody ready? What was the tube spacing used in the breezeway? And Bob, I'll go back to you maybe while people are uh, putting their answer in. Is, is there any other uh, comments or questions we want to? Oh, yeah, address? plenty of questions and some comments. Uh, we can, I guess, do a couple of them and do it. Somebody asked about placement stools for the wire mesh to hold it up. I know that's an option to um, instead of lifting it. You can raise it up on those strip chairs sometimes. You can. Uh, what, what our experience has been, and maybe we're just clumsy, but welded wire fabric versus rebar. Uh, rebar, absolutely, you can put it up on chairs. Half inch rebar, you can walk around on it. You can step over it. The problem with welded wire, at least our experience has been that by the time the masons are in there, they've, they've pretty much trampled a number 10 gauge steel wire, trampled it right down. So it, it also becomes, uh, it, it's sort of like walking on a circus net. I, I use that analogy. It's it's difficult to walk around, you know, when you're getting ready to do the pour and this uh, this welded wires up on these chairs. Uh, first of all, it, just about any person that steps on it, if you don't step directly on a chair, and I, that'd probably break the plastic chair, uh, it's just going to bend it. So we found, uh, we've seen projects in the past where they've tried to use concrete bricks to support it. Same thing you end up with uh, a lot of just deformed rebar. So our preference has been leave the welded wire flat, tie it all together good, and then lift it during the pour. Yeah, yeah, I've had the same experience. It just sags, unless you put those strip chairs every two feet, it just sags between them. And then it's a it's a big tripper for the concrete finishers. They don't uh, yeah. see one concrete finisher just get in there and start stomping all the chairs down because they're so... Yep. Upset yeah, they, about tripping over him as he tried to walk through there, and he just stomped them all into the foam. And I said, "Well, that was a waste of time and money." So yeah, it, a lot depends on your concrete guys too, what they're willing to, uh, what kind of mood they're in the day they show up. Let me see another one. Uh, how do you control the temperature of the piping in the garage? Um, there's no mixing valve to adjust the temperature. Maybe we missed the detail there. I didn't see it. Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, there is no mixing valve on there. Uh, Basically, we're pumping directly through that heat exchanger. We did take a look at the heat transfer rate based on the water temperature. And, uh, you know, remember our maximum water temperature coming into the primary side of that heat exchanger was 110 degrees. So if we were feeding that heat exchanger from a boiler and, and coming in at, you know, 150, 180, we would definitely need a mixing device there. But because our primary side water temperature was relatively low and of course you do lose some uh, temperature differential across the uh, heat exchanger there was really no need to put a mixing valve in there but it's a good observation though good question yeah uh, i'll do one more and then we'll do the uh, the giveaway travis asked why the tubing runs on the main floor overlap i think you talked about a little bit the um 
uh, because of the spacing, the three tubes per bay, or maybe you yep. can answer that. Yeah, in the drawing, they overlap, and that has to do with just how we lay it out in terms of pulling. Remember, this this is kind of a tedious uh, installation method. It, it works well, but it's it's tedious. You basically have to pull the tubing off the uncoiler and run it through a series of holes in the framing and kind of work your way back towards the uncoiler. And it, it does. there are some areas where on the drawing, it, it looks like it's overlapping. And in actuality, the tubes do overlap, but they have to in order to get the radius on the tubing. Um, you know, it might be possible with a, a lot of uh, <laughs> difficulty to, yeah. to put it in there eight inches on center, but it's going to take a lot more, a uh, lot more finesse to do that. Yeah. So we, but, we try to create these larger radius bends, and it does create a little bit of overlap. Yeah, and with the pex out pex, you got to be careful when you're pulling through joists like that. You can kink it, and then you end up with splices in it because it's a uh, it doesn't go back to the, the shape yeah. once you keep it in half. Yeah. yeah, you definitely want a couple people to to do this. You just, uh, Bob, you've been there, and as I have, yeah. have as well, just pulling all that tubing through those trace cavities. It's it's basically like putting a lace in your shoe. You just got to work it through and be yeah. patient. Yeah. Um, let me do. Let's see uh, what else we had here. Uh, some of these I'll let you you can answer them offline too. Um, Oh, for zone one, this I thought was a good one. Do you feel the heat faster in the living room with the panel reds versus the in-floor area? You know, honestly, that, that again is a very good observation. Uh, in theory, the floor is going to lag behind the panel reds. Honestly, in practice, you know, the water temperatures we're working with and a, a narrow differential on the thermostat, you, you literally do not feel any difference. You, you walk in and you're just comfortable. So we, yeah. we have not actually monitored that response time but um, from a practical standpoint no you you don't feel a situation where you've got you know radiant heat convective heat coming off the paddle rads and the floor is quote unquote cold it just um, there's a just enough of a I guess I'd call it a fudge factor there uh, uh, just an inherent property that it's it's not a problem I think you're in a zone too, Siggy, where the heat kind of comes on and stays on. It's not like here in Missouri where it can be 60 one day in the winter and zero the next day. We have a, a wide swing and that's really tough on high mass slabs or even the thin mass slabs. But I would say in your area with that low supply temperature, it probably goes on and doesn't turn it, off it, until May. It does. It does. And in fact, if the system was set up with outdoor reset control on the buffer tank, uh, right now our system, we're going to cover this more next week, but our system is basically a set point. So we're we're turning the heat pumps on if the buffer tank drops to 100, we're turning them off at a, at 110. Um, so in theory, under part load conditions, the water is actually warmer than it has to be, but it's not grossly warmer. So you know the differential on the thermostat's about one degree. Uh, you just don't honestly, you just don't feel when the heat's on versus when the heat is off. And if it was outdoor reset control, in theory. And you had the control properly adjusted, you'd have continuous circulation. So yeah. the floor and the panel rads are basically going to be in this quasi steady state condition pretty much all the time. So the question I had, I thought was a good one. Where does the garage drain empty into? That doesn't go into a septic, does it? Just daylight? No. Or? no uh, the garage drain actually goes out and it empties into uh, the same drainage system that uh, the gutters do. And ultimately, it goes out to daylight yeah. uh, with the slope of the property. So, yeah, we uh, we didn't want the garage drains uh, tied in with the footing drains. You know, if somebody washes a car in the garage or you know, just has a large volume of water going down there, we didn't want that water to potentially go down. And, you know, in theory, it wouldn't come up into the, the basement or anything. But uh, we, we had a completely separate uh, glued solid pipe um, for the garage drains and the uh, um, gutter drains to go into. Uh, Delta T that you designed the system on, I think we'll wrap up with that one and then we'll do the, uh, the giveaway here. Um, Delta T, I'm not sure, I mean Delta T between inside and outside was... I think you're um, operating Delta T that you designed around for the, I guess you've got different zones, maybe they were different. Your well, I, I can tell you with the flow rate that we've got, we're, we're 
probably seeing a delta T, and I, I have not measured it specifically, but we're probably seeing a delta T somewhere around 10 or 12 degrees. It's, if anything, we probably could slow the flow down a little bit. Um, and, and again, we can play around with that. Right now, we've got the 0018 that is running the main floor. It's uh, on a proportional differential pressure mode, I think, on, on the, the higher setting. But we could we could reduce that down and, and get a lower flow, save probably another five watts, and uh, have a little wider delta T. Uh, but to, to address the question, it, typically with radiant floor heating, I, I don't like to go over 15 degrees in a space where you're going to potentially have people in socks or barefoot. Just just to minimize that floor temperature variation. In a garage, we could go wider. We could go 20. Industrial garages, we've actually gone to 25 degrees. Um, panel radiators can actually go to a, a wider delta T. Although I'll, I'll caution you, at really low water temperatures, you know, when you're dealing with 105 degree water, uh, you know, in theory, in theory, you could go to a delta T that would bring you back at room air temperature but it's very difficult to get much uh, heat out when you're trying to do something like that. So I would say with low water temperatures, a panel radiator, probably nothing more than a 20 degree design condition temperature drop. I, this question came up a couple of times. Again, it's a good one. Uh, the sleeves on the, uh, for the control joint, just slipped them in from the end or were they split that you could snap them over? How'd you get your control? Uh, that was split. That was a split uh, polyethylene. So they, they opened right up and popped right on. Matthew we have up. done it where you slip them in from the end in the past. Eh, <laughs> it's yeah. it's time okay. consuming. You got to slide them all, you know, all the way down through. It's it's easier if you can get a a, a thin wall split um, sleeving material. I think we're looking pretty good. And I, it looks like Mary uh, did the, the shirt, found the first person. I saw a lot of people came in with the right answer. I didn't see which one came in first, but Mary must have been monitoring that. And I think she's responded on that. So master oh, bedroom okay. radiator location, why not an exterior wall? I think that's about it for the question. Good question. Uh, we needed a five foot radiator in there. And we, uh, given, we looked at where the furniture was going to go and we just could not accommodate that under a window. Uh, but again, these are great questions, very observant. So we, we put that one basically where we knew there was not going to be a dresser or, or a headboard for a bed. Uh, it's actually in a traffic lane uh, between where you come in the bedroom and where you would go to the master bathroom. I think I typed in some answers that we went. There might be a couple that are specific to you, Siggy, that you can look them over when uh, Mary sends you the, the Excel file on that. But uh, what else here? There's uh, We'll do a couple of the other slides. And if Mary has any other questions that somebody might have raised their hand or something, we could uh, open the mic. Um, there's our team in Milwaukee for tech support. If you have any uh, questions on any of the products or applications, uh, call us, email us, uh, FaceTime us. We'll get to you. Um, next session, I guess you can talk to this one a little bit, Siggy, what you're going to go over next. Yeah, this is going to be the last session. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on the controls and also, you know, we've looked at parts of the system. We've looked at today, for example, the garage. We looked at the basement. We looked at the first floor. We're going to put it all, all these subsystems are going to come back together into that one overall schematic. And then you'll see the, uh, the electrical diagram there, which Again, when you first look at it, it might look complicated, but it's actually a, a pretty simple control system. So we're gonna focus on that. And also I'll talk a bit about how we incorporated domestic hot water uh, into this system. So next Tuesday. All right, well, unless Dan or Mary have anything else, I think we're a little bit over time, but thanks everybody for hanging in there. We had a great crowd today. So um, yeah, okay. I'm looking forward to next week, the controls. That always uh, seems most of the heating guys get a little sometimes balled up on the controls, especially when you have to build a customized one. But it looks like you did it with pretty much off the shelf parts. You didn't have to have a special PLC control build or anything for it. It looks like you made a, right. an every man's control. So that'll be fun next time, next week. Okay. Excellent. Nice job, Ziggy. Pretty nice. And yep, John, and we, we have got to do a shout out to Paul Nicholson, all the way from Calgary, Alberta. His answer six inches. I'm assuming that's the correct answer, but boy, was he a bunch. <laughs> and he is getting an official uh, and unique Getting Schooled by Siggy t-shirt. So, so watch for that. Good. I think our... Uh, 
our winner last week was from Canada as well. So you, you're correct. Yes. They, they jump right on that Jeopardy button first thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John, so much, Bob and Dan and our audience. We'll Excellent. see you next week. Looking forward to it.